What is true of America is true also of China. China does not cohere around uncontested Confucian or Asian values. Instead, just like America, China experiences conflicts over contested truths, reflecting its internal pluralism and external context. Chinese civilization is pluralist. The different strands of cynic civilization have emerged from numerous reinventions of Confucianism in China and the various forms through which they grafted themselves onto the sociocultural system of China's neighbors. Although they never fully abandoned their indigenous and Buddhist traditions, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, in different ways and for different reasons, adopted or emulated characteristic Chinese state practices. Historically, writes Wang Gongwu, sinicization was not associated with coercion and the need to dominate. Rather, it was a matter of China's neighbors emulating Chinese practices that they found to be effective in exercising domestic control and in managing their foreign affairs, especially with China. For example, the calendar, education systems, and civil service exams all required of Confucianism and Chinese culture. Although Korea was most directly exposed to China, it was not China, but Korean neo-Confucians who imposed Chinese standards and practices. Vietnam underwent a process of self-Confucianization to avoid Chinese occupation. And even though Japan was less exposed to Chinese influences than were these two countries, it too imported Tang Dynasty norms and practices. Chinese Confucianism is as plastic and contested as American liberalism. Discarded as an imperial institution since the late 19th century and hollowed out as a political ideology, the relevance of various incarnations of new Confucianism is now seen to lie in its humanism. Widely thought to have been a major factor for many of China's ills during the last two centuries, in recent years the Chinese government has vigorously re revived Confucianism. This ideology operates on the basis of hierarchical, reciprocal, based values. The political qualities that supposedly flow from these values, wisdom, morality, generosity, obligation to respect the interests of others, are now extolled as assets, not as liabilities. The ethical and religious concerns of Confucian humanism remain relevant in seeking to address some of contemporary China's most pressing problems. Two Wei Ming's conceptualization is largely congruent with the writing of Shmuel Eisenstadt and the concept of multiple tradition. For two, cultural China focuses on the meaning of being Chinese. It is not a geopolitical, linguistic, or ethnic concept. Instead, cultural China is defined by transnational relationships in greater China and the fluid borders separating civilization from barbarism. Cultural China emerges from the dialogues within and between these different Chinese worlds and with the erstwhile peripheries of the Chinese world now thrust in the unaccustomed role of helping to civilize China. And outside of China, but in the Sinocentric sphere of cultural influence, contested and contestable traditions of Confucianism can also be found in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. In short, in its various incarnations, Confucianism is not an essential attribute of Chineseness rooted in an empire, polity, or modern nation state. It is instead a cultural resource mobilized primarily among the periphery of transnational Chinese networks. Furthermore, inside mainland China, the tradition of Confucianism is complemented by and competing with alternative traditions of Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, popular religion, atheism, and secularism. Perhaps even more striking is the regional revival of multiple cultural traditions in China. China is divided in five ways, east, west, north, south, and center. Relying on overly schematic and simplifying terms for purposes of this lecture, I would argue that the cosmopolitanism and economic dynamism of China's coastal areas and the patriotism and relative economic backwardness of China's heartland constitute multiple traditions that provide the fodder for vibrant debates and disagreements inside China's civilization. Other civilizations have a very large stake in these debates. Numerous dramatic transformations in contemporary China evoke the image of a very large man 
rolling over in a very small bathtub. In doing so, that man must create some very big waves and cannot help but make a mess on the bathroom floor, and that mess may affect the neighbors. I've chosen American and Chinese civilizations as two examples for the thesis that civilizations are plural and pluralist, and that in this central respect, China, America, and Islam are perfectly normal and unexceptional civilizations. In a book published this past summer under the title Civilizations in World Politics, which you can look at at the end of the hall, I've made the analogous case for all of the world's other major civilizations. Concepts like East and West have never been able to describe accurately our past. They do not describe accurately our present, and they will never describe accurately our future. These categories create a make-believe world in which intellectuals who are trying to gain fame and fortune can wage their intellectual battles, and in which politicians who attempt to conquer or consolidate power can mislead their publics into unnecessary risky and political adventures or military confrontations. Let me conclude. Civilization is not a condition but a process created by human practices. Those who think of themselves as civilized were at an earlier time uncivilized and are always at risk of becoming uncivilized in the future. These practices sum in the aggregate to civilization of processes such as Americanization, Islamization, or Sinicization. They are producing and reproducing behavior on symbolic boundaries. In today's world, these processes are nested in one global civilization of modernity. We can trace trans-civilizational engagements and inter-civilizational encounters in a variety of different practices. In their internal and external relations, civilizations are marked by debate and disagreements. Contestation generates different processes and outcomes. One such outcome, cultural imperialism, describes the unilateral imposition of the norms and practices of one civilization upon local norms and practices that it seeks to displace or destroy. A second outcome describes the wholesale adoption by local actors of the format, but not the content, of imported cultural products and practices. Finally, a third outcome, and the one that is most typical in the relations among major civilizations, describes a world of hybridization in which local norms and practices are altered by selectively appropriating imported practices. This is the give and take that defines civilizational processes, the exchange of cultural material, information, ideas, values, norms, and identities. It highlights shifting balances of practices rather than balances of power within and between different civilizations. I've argued here for a view that stresses the pluralism and the plurality of a world of civilizations, a world into which Islam, China, and America fit comfortably as very normal and unexceptional cases. Far from being unique, both China and America are comparable to all other major civilizations. Our world of civilizations is for the most part character characterized by inter-civilizational encounters and trans-civilizational engagements, and only very rarely by civilizational clashes. The last two decades and the relations between cynic and American civilizations provide ample documentation for this proposition. I thus have argued in these remarks that common preconceptions shared alike by conservatives and liberals in both East and West are seriously misguided. Rather than help us build a better and more diverse world in which all civilizations can teach and all can learn and in a common context, these preconceptions risk building a world of fear and walls in which civilizations are reduced to delivering monologues of the one right way yielding not engagement and encounters, but clashes. The opening line of Kipling's 1899 poem, The Ballad of East and West, suggests that the two shall never meet. Kipling was wrong. Civilizations are most similar not in their cultural coherence, isolation, or tendency towards clash, but in their pluralist differences, in their plurality, and in their encounters and engagements. We should resist the temptation of excessive simplification and the fallacy of misplaced polarities entailed in a binary distinction between East and West. Instead, we should embrace the intellectual and political opportunities of what one scholar has called 
contaminated cosmopolitanism. This concept captures nicely the messy core currents of sameness and difference that is the defining trait of a world of plural and pluralist civilizations. Thank you. Professor Katzenstein has graciously agreed to take some questions from the floor. I see that the microphone is now positioned in the middle of the auditorium. If anyone would like to ask a question, please form a nice orderly line behind the mic, and I would uh, remind questioners of two simple observations. The first one is that in all things, brevity is the soul of wit. The second thing is that it's very easy to turn a long statement into a question by saying, what do you think at the end? Please try to resist that temptation. The first question. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, as an American who uh, is starting his PhD at Sydney University um, and just left Washington, D.C., um, it's hard to miss, in my opinion, the fact that President Obama and uh, what he's bringing to the United States and the world seems to fit well into the model that you're presenting as a pluralist president. Um, is that, do you think that's a fair statement? And, and what would you, what do you think he's bringing to um, the model that you're talking about in terms of a multinational pluralist society that seems to be emerging? Peter, would you like to do your Phil Donahue and be out in the Yeah, crowd? yeah, I'd rather okay. have my I think you get an A. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, his Cairo speech, his biography in his Cairo speech, right? Yes. I mean, the Cairo speech is a very articulate statement of the position which I outlined. I read books, he is a politician, there's a difference, but the message is the same, okay? And if you think, it's part of the argument, you know, I'm not saying, oh, Sam Huntington is totally wrong, he's not. You know, the construction of primordiality is a political process. Huntington was writing the book saying, I want to change the way you look at the world. And actually, he didn't change it. I mean, that's the way we have looked at the world for 150 years. It was the old way of looking at the world updated, right? But it was very political. And, and, you must, and he was writing the book not as a scholar, but as a public intellectual, I believe. Uh, so, and he writes with great clarity. He is a, one of the great, great scholars, you know, unfortunately... Uh, uh, doesn't live any longer. So, um, but the 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 notion that uh, that Obama represents and which lives is in fact, I think, much closer to the truth. Right? But Obama himself does know that primordiality exists as a political process and category. I mean, he's experiencing it right now while he's in office. Right? Uh, he thought he could change the climate. Well. It turns out that this climate in American domestic politics uh, is hard to change. And Obama is waging a more vicious war against Al-Qaeda than George W. Bush ever did. If you want to count out the number of children and women killed in Pakistan and Afghanistan, the list among Obama is much longer. Okay. So, and his acceptance of the Nobel Prize, in fact, it's not an Obama doctrine to this problem of the, a world in which evil cannot be thought away and that he as a political leader has a responsibility. And that part of the lecture I want to underline, you know, talks to that point. Uh, primordiality is a, is a fact of life and as a polit politician or political scientist you have to take account of it. And the other one which I'm sure Obama would not be so happy to hear is, you know, the lecture makes a strong argument against cosmopolitan liberalism. You know, my friends all say, oh, great, you don't like hunting. Wow, that's terrific. Uh, they don't like at all the critique of cosmopolitan liberalism. And I feel nervous about it. I haven't thought it through. Okay. But it strikes me that the logic of one standard, whether from the right or whether from the left, is not in tune with what's happening politically. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Um, yes, I'd, I'd just like to ask you something quite specific. Um, I mean, I agreed with a lot of what you had to say about the reductive quality of the Huntington thesis, the tendency to oversimplification, the sort of suppression of dissenting elements and so on, and 
I mean, I, I accept that. But isn't it also true that one of the strengths of the Huntington thesis relates to issues of power and politics and ways in which certain forms of ideological control gain a kind of hegemony. And I'm thinking, to take your China example, of the issues at the moment around Google um, and the, the, you know, the issues around censorship, the, the way in which the Obama administration has, as it were, pinned its own sort of liberal ideology, if you want to call it that, in, in a kind of clash of... Um, you know, what the, what the Obama, the United States wants to sort of um, suggest is a kind of clash of freedom against censorship. Now, of course, from the Chinese point of view, it's an issue about, you know, internal regulation, the laws of their own country. I don't at all disagree with your thesis that I'm sure there's a lot of dissent within China and lots of different sort of regional variations. But if one thinks about the way in which certain kind of power blocks exercise control, wouldn't that be an argument in support of the Huntington thesis? Well, it, you know, if the title of the book was The Clash of Big States, yeah, sure. But then people wouldn't have bought it. The, for him, civilizations are the actors. And this is, in, in civilizations, the power of civilizations is measured. The indicators are the same as indicators for state power. GDP, population, material capabilities. This makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, if you look at scholarship on civilizations, what do they talk about is literary, that is secular literature, and religion as modes of thinking of who you are. Right? So I perfectly accept the notion that you know, civilizations are not, civilizational analysis is not going to help you understand the conflict over Google. For that, you need international relations. And one of the parts of the analysis which I didn't talk about is how do you analyze the embedding of states or empires or polities into this civilizational complex? I left that out, right? But Huntington slips. In fact, you know, he writes about civilization the first three chapters, and after that, it's all the old stuff about real, real politique. You know, that, and even my undergraduate classes wouldn't be treated too well by my teaching assistants, right? because it's incoherent intellectually. So as for Google, yeah, this is a state saying we are not buying into the notion of information liberalism, right? We will control it because sovereignty is here for us. It's not to be defined away by anybody. Seems to me a perfectly reasonable, coherent political position, and Google will now make its money someplace else and the Chinese information retrieval system will have lack of competitiveness, and eventually they're going to work it out. Seems to me a perfectly normal conflict, interesting to watch. Next question. Uh, if, so if civilizations aren't actors, um, and they're pluralist and pluralizing, uh, then why bother with the concept at all? I mean, why isn't the logical conclusion of your thesis and your research that we should do away with civilizational Right. discourse in general, uh, and given that the sort of literary cultural material you, you mentioned would be incredibly complex and difficult to gather up into large-scale uh, schema anyway. So why bother with civilizations to begin with? Well, first of all, because it's large and complex. Thank you. Okay. I like that. Uh, but the second one is, if that is true, then why bother about markets? That is, why bother about anything except the geo strategy and geopolitics doctrine of the 19th century. Because markets embed states, but Dick Cheney says they don't matter. Okay? So if the social context doesn't matter, the, the economic context wouldn't matter. And then, of course, the ecological context wouldn't matter either. Then you have a world of raw, naked, materialist power politics. Now, I know a country pretty well which believed that that was how the world worked. Okay? I'm from Germany. It didn't work out too well for the Germans. Okay? They fought that 30 years war from 1914 to 1945, and it wasn't a winning, winning war. It was a losing war because they misunderstood how reality works. So I think you will have to take into account the economic, ecological, and to understand how states behave. That seems to me almost ineluctable. So the fact that it's complex I grant, is fun for a professor, but strip away the complexity and just say, 
I will look at the social context, social ideological context in which states work. And I think looking at Australia, which can move, depending on which party is in power, from being a suburb of Washington DC to being close to Beijing or Tokyo within a month, it's quite clear that this matters. Peter, could I just uh, ask you, I can't resist asking you to go in the other direction. Benjamin Netanyahu, I think, said a couple of days ago when asked about his new settlements in East Jerusalem, he said, new settlements in East Jerusalem, Jews have been building in East Jerusalem for 3,000 years. Isn't, isn't Huntington right that a struggle such as that between the Israelis and the Palestinians is, quote-unquote, civilizational? Yeah, I mean, I think there are other cases you can find you know, based on the research of Brubaker and the Balkans. Places in the world where the sedimentation of historical conflicts is so deep that, in fact, these binaries become natural. People think that's just the way it is. Uh, and as I said, the political primordiality tells us that you can't say, oh, this never happens. It does happen. But is it the typical thing? So if you think, you know, of the literature on which hunting was building, which was Toynbee, right, in Spengler, well, clash is one of 24 categories in Toynbee's taxonomy. It's not the only category. There are lots of other things happening between civilizations. And I think it's looking at a prominent example is privileging and biasing our assessment of what's normal and what's abnormal. Uh, and I use the Chinese-American example very much. He said there are two clashes looming between East and West. One is Islam, 9-11, the other one is with China. Okay, in the parlance of social science, that's being half of the time right, 0.5. Now, the social sciences are like the natural sciences, but 0.5 is nothing to be proud of, okay? It's like flipping a coin, so. Yes, the next question. If you are given a chance to advise the Obama government, how would you find your Americans' China policy? If I was given a chance, I would certainly not accept it. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And fighting inside a bureaucracy for foreign policy I would be terrible at. So I would certainly not accept it. Um, I think, you know, I'd say for about 30 years, since the late 1970s, America has followed a very successful grand strategy towards China under both Republican and Democratic part, uh, uh, administrations, nonpartisan, which is a policy of engagement. Now, you know, you will get under both administrations the opposition always saying, ah, but your expectations are too high. They are not doing X, Y, and Z, okay? Uh, but in fact, it's been remarkably effective. And I think there is more continuity between Bush and Obama on this domain than almost any other foreign policy. Okay? So I talked to Tom Christensen quite a lot, who was you know, in the State Department and a former colleague at Cornell. Uh, and they're all saying Obama is doing it just right. Yeah, here maybe a footnote, there maybe a footnote, but basically it's a foreign policy of continuity. Will this stay? This, I think, is much more questionable because you've got a leadership succession in both countries. And it's unavoidable that the Democrats will turn more protectionist. Okay. Uh, that's just for political reasons pre-programmed. And it's unavoidable that in China, as you get a leadership changeover, you will get more infighting and conflict. So I think the next two years will be pretty rocky. But the long-term strategy is appreciated by both sides. And the fact that Taiwan is now taking off the front burner helps it greatly. I think we have time for one more question. Is there another question that someone would like to ask in the audience? No one wants to bite on any Islam issues. Ah, the Vice Chancellor wants to follow his Dean of Arts. To I the do, microphone. and I want to take up Duncan's question in a slightly different way, which is to say the question is really given the tendency towards primordialism of that term civilization, 
is the term itself helpful? There are other ways of talking about the kinds of pluralities, words like culture, like um, political or economic system. What is it that civilization adds conceptually and analytically to merely the metrics of those other, um, of those other ideas? You mean what the concept of civilization adds? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a very good question. I get asked this a lot because particular people on the political left don't like the term. It comes with all the connotations of bad things in life, okay? Uh, and I say, all right, you don't like the term. What about East and West? They don't like that either. I say, okay, what do you work on? And they give me the subject. I said, let's have a bet. I'll count how much on the front page of your newspaper of choice you will find your term, and I'll find East and West. And it turns out nobody wants to take the bet because this is how people normally organize it, including public intellectuals, professors who are very sophisticated. We need these mental simplifying devices in order to organize a world in which information overload is just with us all the time. Right? And we, of course, use them unreflectively. And if we use them unreflectively, somebody will come along and tell us that's really how it is. It's not just a shortcut. That is the reality. And that is what hunting did brilliantly. But this is what political leaders do in enormous numbers in all parts of the world. East, west, north, south. I don't care. That's why I think, you know, the, the bottom line of the message is to say conservatives are wrong, liberals are wrong, people in the west are wrong, and people in the east are wrong. They are burying what actually is going on. Because the politics of interest make the simplifications which we use as a metaphor, gives them an opening to make us think this is natural, but it isn't. Thank you. Could I just follow up? But Peter, doesn't it make sense if you're in China and it's a polyglot country and it has all of these differences, doesn't it make sense for the Chinese leadership to talk about China as a civilization, something that's been there for thousands of years, the West's only been there for 200 years, don't tell us that we're newly on the block, we've been there before. If there are big incentives for political leaders to use that kind of language, isn't it a real part of the world? This is the, the converse of Michael's point. It's a real part of the world that's not going away. It's not isolated to Israelis and Palestinians. It's a common metaphor to bind the kind of disparate plural societies you're talking about together. Yeah, I think this is right. I mean, I gave, you know, I talked about a thousand people in China in a period of two days last November. You know, you were there at the Civilization Forum. I gave four lectures in the day before to various university audiences. Each about the audience was this large or larger in each of them. Uh, I, people were very interested in the, in the concept, sinicization, civilization. They found that extremely intriguing. I didn't get a single question which was not Huntingtonian. This is very interesting, but you, obviously you're wrong. I had an interview at CCTV9, okay, which is sort of the, whatever, ABC2, which you have here, right? Sort of public television in English for sort of the cosmopolitan set. Uh, well, that person let me talk for about, he didn't know what I was arguing. He talked for about three minutes and said, I think you owe the Chinese people an apology. And I said, beg your pardon? Because you clearly don't understand anything about China. We are united, we have always been united, and you are wrong, okay? That is, China is deeply penetrated by Huntingtonian analysis, not because of Huntington, although he showed, sold a lot of books there. No, because this is the construction of Han supremacy in the last multinational empire which still exists. China will not look like this 50 years from now. So open, just the way America can't conquer Iraq, China cannot sit on top of Northwest China and Tibet for the last time. Everything in history tells us that these empires will decline. It's the last one. And of course the leadership knows it. And it has no answer other than the technocratic management of the economy. Well, once you're in a capitalist economy, all you can know is there are the seven fat years and then there are the seven poor years. They have the seven fat years right now. That's going to come to an end. And then I'd like to see that system. Uh, so on behalf of everyone in the audience, on behalf of ABC Big Ideas, uh, Sydney Ideas at the University of Sydney and the U.S. Studies Centre. I, I hope everyone will join me again in thanking Peter Katzenstein for a, 
really wonderful presentation this afternoon. Thanks, Peter.